Our second lesson for the day is found in the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts. It's the traditional text for Ascension Sunday, beginning at verse 6 of chapter 1. So when the disciples had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into the heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, would you pray with me? Father, we are here today because we want to live as your people. We want to be your people here in this world. We want to live according to the way of Christ. So we pray, Father, that you'll fill us with the mind of Christ. Help us to define love. Help us to define happiness. Help us to define grace. Help us to define truth as you define it. We thank you for this day, especially for this day, God. We thank you for the joy of this day as we celebrate the ascension of our Lord. And I pray, God, that we will receive a fresh word from you this day as we seek to be the people of Jesus in this world. We ask now, O oh God, that you will give each one of us ears to hear what you're saying to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I am told, and I deeply believe it, that Emory Carlton Nicholson had a great, great impact on my life when I was growing up. Emory Nicholson was my maternal grandfather. I called him, I'm told, I, I called him Papa. Papa and my grandmother had a great impact on my life because my parents who both worked in a cotton mill, my mother as a spinner, my father as a doffer, would get up early, early, early in the morning, and they would take me to this set of grandparents, and they kept me all day long while my parents worked. So I've been told that Papa, as I called him, had a great influence on my life. I don't remember much about Papa, other than perhaps the stories I've been told about Papa. I'm not sure where my memory stops and where the stories I've heard begin. But people tell me I'm, I'm very much like Emory Carlton Nicholson. You see, what happened was when I started the first grade in 1967, within a couple months, uh, Papa suddenly passed away at age 64. So I don't have a lot of memories of him, but a lot of older members of my family tell me that um, in some ways I'm very much like him. I stayed with him every day, he and my grandmother, every day there on their farm while my parents worked. Um, my grandfather, Papa, was um, like our whole family of, of Scott-Irish descent. Uh, he was a little closer to Ireland than I am, and that means several things. One thing it meant was that he sort of had uh, a strong Irish temper. 
He also had a full head of red hair, I'm told. You may not believe this, and you can't imagine this, I can't imagine this, but back when I had hair, and back before it turned gray, what little I had, uh, my, my hair was almost auburn color because of my connection to Papa and that line of Irishmen in my family. But Papa had a huge influence on me, that red-headed grandfather of mine. That's one of the reasons I don't care much for the phrase, and I'm sure you've heard the phrase, a red-headed stepchild. <laughs> That's an American phrase. I'll tell you in a moment where that phrase comes from, um, which will explain again why I don't like that phrase. But certainly that phrase is used to mean someone or something that is neglected or mistreated or even unwanted. That's a red-headed stepchild. Where that term came from was the 1830s, 1840s, as many Irish immigrants were coming to the United States, uh, they were not received with a warm welcome in the 1830s, 1840s. All across the United States of that day, there would be shops that would be looking for uh, hired help, and they would put signs in their window saying something like, uh, now hiring, Irish need not apply. So red-headed stepchildren, a red-headed stepchild, was a reference to the Irish people back in those days. So I don't like that phrase, red-headed stepchild, for some obvious reasons, but not the least of which, it is very derogatory toward both redheads and stepchildren. But I do understand the phrase. I hear the phrase frequently. And I want to use the phrase right now, if you will allow me, in a lot of ways on the Christian calendar, the day of ascension is the red-headed stepchild of the Christian calendar. You probably know all about Christmas. You know about Holy Week. You know about Easter. Uh, hopefully you know about Pentecost but probably not a lot about Ascension Day. You see, we're told about the Ascension of Jesus Christ in the New Testament only from Luke. Luke wrote his Gospel, and of course Luke wrote the book of Acts, that history of the early church. So Luke tells us about that event of Ascension. Luke tells us it was 40 days after Easter, 40 days after the resurrection of Christ, when Jesus spent time with his closest followers, teaching them, as the Bible says, about the kingdom of God, that he then led them out to the Mount of Olives, there outside of the holy city, Jerusalem. After 40 days of teaching, he led them out on the Mount of Olives. He led the 11 out there on the Mount of Olives because... Judas is already gone at this point, and Matthias has not been chosen yet to replace Judas. Jesus takes them out on the Mount of Olives. He teaches them some important truths on the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus ascends back to the Father. You know, if you go with me to Israel one day there is a place there on the Mount of Olives, a little church is built around it. Inside that little chapel there is a rock and it does look like there's a footprint on that rock and they will tell you it's from that rock that Jesus ascended. Don't know about that, I have to admit I'm a little skeptical about that rock, but I'm not skeptical about the ascension of Christ and the role that that should play in our Christian faith. When you look at the text, you see some important truths and you see the event of the ascension. One of the first things I want you to notice from this text is that Jesus took his followers out on the Mount of Olives. That's the mount overlooking the holy city on the other side of the Kidron Valley. He took them out on the Mount of Olives and he told them some important things before, before he ascended, and he even took time at this point to tell his followers that they would have to be patient. Now, I don't know about you, I struggle with patience. Jesus 
told his followers on this day they would have to be patient. The Bible tells us over and over and over we've got to be patient. In the book of Psalms, you are constantly being told, wait on the Lord to be patient. We've always struggled with patience. You see these disciples here with Jesus at the ascension. He knows they're going to struggle with patience. Notice what they do, verse 6. So when the disciples came out together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time? Is now the time when you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? Good question, by the way. Is this the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice what Jesus does not say at this point. Jesus does not say, what in the world are you talking about? There's no kingdom for Israel. That's Old Testament stuff. We're beyond that now. That's not what Jesus says. It's a good question. It's a little misguided, but it's a good question. When they ask Jesus, is now the time? when you will restore the kingdom to Israel. You see, the ancient Jewish hope still stands. God never has plan A and then plan B. That's why we kept the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as part of our sacred text. It's not that the New Testament now has done away with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. God doesn't have plan A, plan B. If God were that way, we could all be worried that there's going to be a plan C one day, and we'll be left out. That's not the way God functions. As Paul says in the book of Romans, God's promises are irrevocable. God never goes back on his promises. So it's a good question that the disciples ask. They're a little misguided. I think still at this point they're looking for a too narrow view of the kingdom that will be restored to Israel. They're looking for a political earthly kingdom that looks a lot like the kingdom of Rome and that's not the way the kingdom will be restored. And that's not what it will look like when it's restored. But the ancient Jewish hope stands the people will be regathered. The ten lost tribes eventually will probably come home. A temple of some sort will be rebuilt. And then a descendant of David will rule forever. But that last thing certainly doesn't surprise you because the descendant of David is ruling right now, isn't he? Jesus is a descendant of David, and I, you, you may not get to, but I get to look at this beautiful window to my right as I preach, and I see King Jesus. I see the ascended King Jesus on this beautiful praise window to my right. A descendant of David is ruling today, and a descendant of David will rule for all eternity. So there's a lot of truth in asking the question, will the kingdom be restored today to Israel. Of course, Jesus tells them just to be patient. The way he answers is simply, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not for you to set the time or to even worry about the time when the kingdom will be fulfilled, when this age will be consummated, when the kingdom will be created completely and the kingdom restored to Israel. It's not it's not up to us even to worry about that and try to set dates. Usually when I read a text like this, my next sentence is, we need to tell, we need to tell all the TV preachers this, that love to set the dates. But since I'm a TV preacher now, <laughs> I'll say we need to sell, tell some of the TV preachers to be careful about setting the dates for when the kingdom will be consummated. Patience. We know that the kingdom is coming. We know that Jesus is going to establish it. We know that it will be established on God's timetable, not ours. We know that God is never early. God is never late. God is always right on time. But in the meantime, in the interim, in the age between the ages, we have to be patient. 
You notice also in the text before Jesus ascended, he taught them something else very important. He told them that as they're being patient, they need to be busy. They need to be busy helping fulfill God's plan for this age. Jesus, here in verse 8, says what I think is one of the most tremendous promises in the New Testament is the outline of the book of Acts. It's actually the outline of all church history. When Jesus says to these 11, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We'll say more about that next week at Pentecost. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, not my judges, not my persecuting attorneys, but you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's the city in which they find themselves. In all Judea, that's the region around Jerusalem. And Samaria, that's the next closest region. And to the ends of the earth, that's High Point, North Carolina. We're to be witnesses. And we're to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. So we need to be busy. We need to be busy doing what God has called us to do, to be witnesses. I I think in this culture in which we live, I rarely run across people who are not busy. But I'm not sure that we are very skillful at being busy about the right things, the good things in life. Life feels frenetic. We usually run at a frenetic pace. For many people in this culture, it feels as if they're on a treadmill and they can't stop the treadmill. And that's why sometimes I I think I see people do destructive, unhealthy things to bring a stop to the treadmill just so they can get off it for a little while. We need to know and we need to learn how to control the treadmill. It's good to be busy, but we ought to be busy doing the right things, the good things in life. Uh, You know the name John Wesley. I hope here at Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church, John Wesley, that great, great evangelist, preacher, scholar of of the 18th century, He was always a busy man, but after he had his Aldersgate experience and he found that vital, vibrant, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he even became busier in a better way. If you look at the life of John Wesley, you notice that it was after his heartwarming experience on Aldersgate Street in that Bible study that he decided that, as he said it, the world is his parish. High Point's not our parish. The world is our parish. And that's why he got busy. If you look at the life of John Wesley, uh, you, you learn he averaged preaching about 15 sermons a week. That's about 40,000 sermons in his lifetime. He traveled, and this is in the 18th century, he traveled more than 250,000 miles proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and he stayed busy up to the end of his life in his, in his late 80s. You and I don't have to be a John Wesley. But we do have to be the person God is calling us to be. We all have been called. We all have been given a ministry. What is your ministry? Whatever your specific ministry is, we know that we're all called to be to be witnesses to Jesus Christ, to the ends of the age. And this work has not been completely accomplished yet. This gospel has not been heard in certain places in the world. There's still people groups on this globe that have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. But even beyond that, I suspect there's people in your family, there's people in your school, people in your workplace who have not found life in Jesus Christ yet. They may have heard, overheard something about this Jesus, but they've not found life in this Jesus Christ yet. So we need to be busy. We need to be busy helping God do God's work in this age till the age is consummated. And that's what Jesus was telling his followers here. And then you notice in the text, it was at this point... After he had said these things, that they saw it happen. They saw the ascension. Verse 9 and following, when Jesus said this, as they were watching, 
Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. We know that cloud to be the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. We see the Shekinah glory throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. At times it would be in the tabernacle. At times it would be in the temple. At times it would be all over the city of Jerusalem. At times it was on Mount Sinai with Moses. That's the Shekinah glory. So Jesus is engulfed in this cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. He's taken up out of their sight. And I love the next piece. Look at it. This is some of the humor, I think, even in the New Testament. Look at the next verse. While he was going up and they were gazing, gawking up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes, these are angels, I'm sure, came and stood by them. These angels just see these disciples gawking. They're still looking. Jesus is probably long gone and they're still looking. I guess I'd be doing the same thing if this had just happened in my presence, they're, they're there gazing up as Jesus ascends back to the Father. And these two angels say, men of Galilee, by the way, all of Jesus' followers were from the Galilee except one. Only one of the original 12 were not from Galilee. Only one of the original 12 was from Jerusalem, Judea, the one called Judas. Judas is not with them now. The angels are smart people. So they now can look at this group and say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up, gawking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This was not just a change of address for Jesus. It means so much more than that. After the ascension of Jesus back to the Father, we don't get less of Jesus, we get more of Jesus. We'll talk about that next week at Pentecost. It's not just a change of address for Jesus, this part of the package that we call the ascension. It's an important part of the package, the package that has made us and claimed us, that package of the passion, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, and then the gift of Pentecost. That's the package that saves us. That's the package that makes us the people of Jesus Christ here in this world. So this ascension is important. I'm so glad that the Apostle Paul helped to explain the ascension to us because sometimes we may think it's just a change of address. He goes from being here to being there. But Paul wants us to be sure we understand it's more than that. In Philippians chapter 2, that great Christ hymn, which might have been a hymn in the early church that Paul is quoting, that great Christ hymn says this, In Philippians 2, therefore God also highly exalted Jesus and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not just a change of address. This is the exaltation of Jesus to the right hand of the Father that place of authority, that place of power, where Jesus now rules as king of the universe. Again, I reference this window to my right. King of the universe. Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 1 that the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who dwells all in all. That's how we see Jesus now. No longer Jesus meek and mild, no longer Jesus the great teacher, so much more. 
If this is a little too much theological language for you this morning, let me attempt to explain this in a way that perhaps a child can understand. I'll use one of my favorite works of literature, The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. That great, great series of children's books. Don't let that confuse you. I still try to read them annually and I get more and more out of the Chronicles of Narnia with each passing year in my life. That series of children's books that is set in the wonderful, wondrous land of Narnia. And the first one you should read, by the way, is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's the first one you should read among the Chronicles of Narnia. hope that you're reading these to your children and to your grandchildren because what will happen as you read these to your children and to your grandchildren as they get older and they spend more time in the Christian community, a lot of the stuff that we talk about, such as the Ascension, will um, raise some memories in them of some things they heard in these fantastic books. In the Chronicles of Narnia, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, four children, Peter, Edmund, Lucy, and Susan, they enter this new marvelous realm called Narnia. They spend their first day in Narnia with a family of talking beavers. In Narnia, the animals, the good animals, all talk. So Peter, Edmund, Lucy, Susan, they're there with this family of talking beavers, and that's when they first hear the name Aslan. Now, in case you don't know, Aslan is the Christ figure throughout all the chronicles of Narnia. And it's here in the line, the witch, and the wardrobe, as these four children are with the talking beavers, that they first hear the name Aslan. Let's pick up the story. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror because he had been very bad. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have. When you wake up in the morning and you realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer and school is over. Well, they eat dinner with these talking beavers, but as soon as dinner is over, these, these four children want to hear some more about Aslan. And they say, oh yes, tell us about Aslan. For once again, that strange feeling like the first signs of spring, like good news had come over them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan said, Mr. Beaver, why don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. Lucy asked, is he, is he a man? Aslan, a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. I, I wonder what you feel when you hear the name of Jesus. I wonder if your view of Jesus is exalted like Ascension Sunday invites us to consider the person of Jesus. I hope that when you think about who Jesus is now, that that will be one of the few times in life you use the word awesome or all. I hope that when you think about Jesus now, you'll be filled with all. I hope that you have a grand, majestic, awesome view of Jesus because if you don't, then he may not be the one who is able to save to the uttermost. But because of who we know him to be, 
Because of the truth of who Jesus is, we know that he is able to save to the uttermost. We know that he can direct human history. We know that he can even work things out in our own lives. When you really understand who Jesus is, then you can understand that because of who Jesus is, you can take comfort in believing that he's got this whether it's human history or whether it's working out God's plan and purpose in your life. He's got this. Now, we're still on a journey. Sin, flesh, and the devil is part of our reality. But superintending over all of this, if we, if, if, if we will yield to him, superintending over sin, flesh, and the devil in the world is this great, great Jesus. The most reasonable, rational thing any of us can do is to yield our lives completely and totally to him. I invite you into just a few moments of prayer. We'll have some silence so that the Spirit can finish this message in your hearts. Would you pray with me? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.